On November of 1999, a legend was born. Unreal Tournament rose from the ashes of Unreal's multiplayer and quickly became one of the top multiplayer shooters of its time. The tale of its successor begins in 2001 with the announcement of Unreal Championship, another joint effort by Epic Games and Digital Extremes. At the same time, they were also working on Unreal Tournament 2, which was effectively a PC version of Championship which shared much of the same code and assets. The developers wanted to bring the series into a new era, initially targeting a release date of June of 2002. Halfway through the year, however, the teams were split in order to speed up development, with Digital Extremes focusing on Championship and Epic Games focusing on Unreal Tournament 2, which later changed names to Unreal Tournament 2003. This way, each team could put their own spin on the same basic formula, and each game could be optimized specifically for its target platform. So while they do share a lot of stuff, some details like weapons had different appearances, and certain maps had to be tweaked or entirely removed from Championship due to hardware limitations. Eventually, both games came out in September of 2002, with Unreal Championship being released on the 24th and 2003 just six days later. Yes, Unreal Tournament 2003 actually came out in 2002. But as you might know, there's more to this video than this stupid game nobody even remembers, since two years later it got shown up by its bigger and better brother. I got all the footage I needed, so back into the shelf it goes. Obviously, I'm just playing that angle for comedy. Unreal Tournament 2004 has a lot to thank 2003 for, because it wouldn't exist without its little brother. 2004 isn't a full-fledged sequel, but rather an updated version that includes all of 2003's content, so there's little reason to bother with it in this day and age. It sought to address criticisms while simultaneously expanding the gameplay into new horizons. Of note is the return of Assault and the introduction of Onslaught, a brand new game type that was primarily handled by a third company, Psyonix. These two are interesting because they integrate vehicles into the gameplay, and 2003's files have leftovers of two scrapped vehicles, an SUV called Bulldog and a hoverbike. Neither of them ever showed up, but similar vehicles do exist in 2004, and the hover bikes might have led to the hoverboards that appeared in Unreal Tournament 3. In reality, these leftovers were remnants of a project called Unreal Warfare, which never saw the light of day but did eventually become something else. A little known game called Gears of War. Regardless, Unreal Tournament 2004 found its way to store shelves in March of 2004. That wasn't so hard now, was it? Since both games are practically identical in many aspects, I won't be covering each one separately. Instead, I'll be explaining the differences between the two as we go along. The story, if you can even call it that, takes place years after the first official tournament was held by the Leandri Mining Corporation. Since then, it grew into a mainstream phenomenon, attracting the attention of competitors and sponsors from all over the universe. Old champions were dethroned and new teams have been formed, and now it's your turn to prove your worth in the tournament. It's as simple as it gets, and that's really all you need for a game like this. The rest is taken care of by its characteristic dark humor, with a dystopian future where mercenaries and dysfunctional bastards from all corners of the universe continuously die horribly for the amusement of the people. Nothing illustrates it better than the Junkyard map, which recreates an incident that happened in a TV game show. Two teams were tasked with building a vehicle to escape the junkyard, but one of the teams decided to instead build some weapons and murder the other team. 
Because there was no rule saying that they couldn't do this, they were crowned winners, and naturally, this was incorporated into the tournament, where it became a very popular event. Unreal Tournament 2003 is entirely dedicated to being a multiplayer FPS. It does have a single-player career mode, but it's just the multiplayer component using AI-controlled bots mixed with a tiny dose of management. You start by picking an avatar, a name and logo for your team, and then fight some qualification matches. After that, you draft a team of seven members and then kill them several times to assert dominance. From there, you have four ladders to complete. And then, when you're done, you unlock the finals, where you can fight for the title of champion. Before every match, you can select which team members will participate and give them one of five roles. Auto, Offense, Defense, Roam, and Support. These can also be adjusted mid-combat through the voice menu, so you can give orders in the middle of combat to shift priorities to help you win each battle. The idea is that every character has their own stats, playstyle and favorite weapon. Although in practice it's hard to tell if the stats actually do anything. Sometimes you also get offered a trade for one of your team members. But it feels mostly pointless, especially because these trades aren't dynamic. They simply occur after specific matches. Unreal Tournament 2004 retains the same structure, but with extra sprinkles of management. Winning matches earns you credits, which can be used to hire more expensive team members and to issue or deny challenges from other teams. You also get the option to swap a match's map for a second one if you'd prefer, and occasionally your team members will be injured and require treatment. However, you get so many credits that it never feels like management so much as pissing around in a sandbox with very tight roads. Stats also still feel meaningless, but more expensive factors do at least seem to be of higher skill than cheaper ones. Unfortunately, the career modes repeat some of the mistakes of the original game from 1999, namely how certain matches have maps that are too large for the number of players in them. Of note is the final match in 2004, which is a repeat of 99's final match, where you fight the legendary Zen Krieger in a one-on-one -on -one duo. It takes place in Hyperblast, a remake of the same map from 99, and what should have been an intense Intense climax marking your rise as champion is instead 5 minutes of actual combat and 15 minutes of both players running around and never bumping into each other, because it's too big for just two players. Not being able to use mutators in here is also a missed opportunity, and a randomizer function would do wonders for replayability, since the maps are always the exact same. Still, if you're playing the games for the first time, this is a good place to start, and the actual gameplay is a blast, regardless of the stuff you do between matches. Unreal Tournament is an arena shooter, which means that players spawn around maps full of weapons, ammo, health and armor. Grab some weapons, shoot the other guys and try to not get shot yourself. There's no reloading, iron sights or accuracy penalties for running and jumping. In fact, you are highly encouraged to do so with the new movement mechanics. Double jumping in particular is a fundamental skill that you need to master if you want to move around the maps efficiently. You can also combine it with dodging to increase the jumping distance, letting you cross bigger gaps that you previously couldn't. You can even dodge in mid-air when next to walls, which is very tricky to do in practice, but potentially game-changing. Since map control is such an important part of the gameplay, mastering your new movement options will give you an advantage over players that stubbornly stick to the ground, both in traversal and in combat. The more agile you are, the easier it is to dodge projectiles and screw up your opponent's aiming, and it lets you access positions and tackle situations in ways that weren't possible in the first game. 
weapons that excel at close ranges, such as the bio rifle and the flak cannon, have benefited tremendously. There aren't many things more satisfying than jumping on an enemy's face and blasting them with shrapnel at point blank, or jumping over an enemy and decking some explosives on their head. The upgraded movement also means that developers can design each map with a bigger emphasis on verticality and platforming, knowing that players can discover shortcuts and rewarding goodies to those that take the time to learn the hardest jumps. You've got less corridors and tight rooms, and more open spaces and platforms to jump on. Combined with the translocator, you effectively have no boundaries as to where you can go in a flash. It's such a simple thing, yet it adds so much depth to the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. The games are Twitch shooters, so reflexes are important. You have to be fast on your feet and mouse, and even faster than your opponent. But that's only one part of the equation. You need reflexes to act, but you also need to think before putting those reflexes to action. You see an enemy. How far is he? What weapon is he using? Are you at a disadvantage? Should you prioritize killing that enemy, or should you rush to the objective? Subconsciously, you're always making these momentary judgments that determine how well you play. To add further decision-making, 2003 introduces Adrenaline Combos. That counter in the upper right corner is the Adrenaline Gauge, which increases whenever you frag enemies or complete objectives, and at 100% you can execute a button combination to trigger a temporary power-up. Speed will double your speed. Booster will slowly recover your health and armor. Berserk increases your overall speed and damage by a bit, and Invisibility is friggin' useless, don't bother with it. The counter increases significantly from special rewards such as multiple kills in a row, so the better you play, the faster your adrenaline recovers and the more often you can give yourself a boost. A well-timed speed combo can make all the difference in modes like Capture the Flag, so think before spending it. If you're wondering what changed between 2003 and 2004, most of it is minor balancing tweaks. The minigun now deals one or two extra points of damage with each shot, while the bio rifle does less damage overall, and the link gun's alternate fire was nerfed to not be as much bollocks as the pulse rifle was back in 99, in exchange for utility in assault and onslaught modes. There are some mechanical differences, but you probably won't notice. One of them is how weapon switching works. In 2003, you don't need to wait for the weapon's firing animation to finish before switching, which is what happens in 2004. This means that you can more quickly mix up your offense with multiple weapons while the slower ones recover. The other is the so-called boost dodge, considered a bug by Epic and a feature by the pros. By standing near a wall and then jumping between the dodging key presses, you could perform an extra large jump. So if you have a wall on your left, you can quickly press right, jump and then again to perform a boost dodge. But it's incredibly hard to pull off smoothly during regular gameplay, so it's not something that the average player will worry about. It's only a factor at very, very high levels of play. There are also mutators that refer to all of these changes, so the option is still there. As usual, the game features deathmatch modes, either solo or with teams. Grab a weapon and smack the other guys enough times to win. Capture the flag also returns, again involving two teams fighting over each other's flags. Bring the opponent's flag back to yours to score a point and prevent them from stealing yours. Double Domination is a variant of the Domination mode from the previous game. Instead of holding down as many control points as you can to score points, your team must instead hold both of the map's control points for 10 consecutive seconds to score a point. Naturally, the two control points are positioned at a significant distance from each other, so team coordination is important. Bombing Run is an all-new mode that mixes traditional combat with 
football. At the start of each round, a ball appears at the center of the map, and each team must launch it through the opposite team's goal to score 3 points, or launch themselves through the goal to score 7 points. And this being a real tournament, of course the other side is frequently laced with death traps. The complications come from the player with the ball not being able to use weapons. Instead, they get a special launcher that can shoot the ball forward or walk onto a teammate and pass the ball to them. By the way, the translocator loses all of its charges after launching the ball, so don't get any funny ideas. It's a very silly concept, but it actually has a lot of strategical depth. There's room for elaborate plays like shooting the ball over obstacles and grabbing it on the other side, or mind games like baiting enemies into a vulnerable position. And yes, launching the ball into an enemy and feeding him some flak cannon is a perfectly valid strategy. Sometime later, Epic Games released the Epic Bonus Pack, a free update that added three new game modes. The first one is Last Man Standing, a variant of Deathmatch where players have limited lives instead of scoring points. Next is Invasion, where players must survive waves of enemies, lifted straight from Unreal 1, in all of their 1998 glory. It's fun, but pretty chank since the monsters have terrible pathfinding and will get themselves stuck behind every little thing. The last one is Mutant, where the first player to score a kill becomes the mutant and instantly gets access to all weapons and a significant increase in speed and damage. Everyone else must then chase the mutant, and whoever scores the kill becomes the new mutant. It's rather unbalanced since the bonuses are insanely strong, but the power trip is pretty fun. 2003 certainly didn't lack variety and quantity, with all the bonus packs that added tons of extra content to play with. But you've probably noticed that something is missing here. Assault mode was very popular back in 99, and its removal caused a considerable amount of backlash on release. The developers claimed that they were looking to push the sports angle, which is why they replaced it with Bombing Run, and also why they changed the name to Unreal Tournament 2003. But that statement was retracted when 2004 brought it back in all its glory. Assault is an objective-based mode that recreates various bits of lore from the Unreal Universe. The attackers must complete a series of objectives within the time limit, while the defenders must prevent the attackers from doing so. At the end of each round, the teams swap places. Of note is that the maps don't have weapons and ammo lying around like normal. Instead, you get a preset loadout from weapon walkers. Several maps also feature vehicles, which didn't exist back in 99 and bring a whole new element to the action. Assault remains the very dynamic chaos that it always was, thanks to the progression through multiple parts of the map. One moment you're trying to lower a bridge in an open space, then you're pushing through some tight corners, then you're riding a vehicle and trying to press some switch. It's constantly evolving. The second big addition is the brand new Onslaught mode, which is played on very large maps with vehicles playing a big role. Both teams have a power core at their home base, and you must connect the power nodes leading to the enemy's base so that their power core is left vulnerable to attack. However, you can't just capture any of the nodes, you must do it in order. This results in a tug of war, where both teams continuously try pushing the other back at every point. Onslaught features the most amount of vehicles of any game modes, and that makes sense given how big the maps are. Vehicles like the Manta and the Raptor allow players to move from one part of the map to the other very quickly, and the Goliath is a bulky tank with a powerful cannon. But this mode also features the Avril, a new weapon that is practically useless against players on foot, but highly effective against vehicles with its instant walk-on and high damage. The Link Gun also gets utility here, not just for repairing vehicles, but also for speeding up the construction of nodes. 
Onslaught is also unique in that you can choose your spawning vocation from any power node that is currently under your team's control and not under attack. The developers also implemented a safety net to prevent stalemates, slowly damaging the cores once the time limit is reached. The rate at which the power cores get damaged depends on how many power nodes each team controls, so even if overtime starts with less health on one side, there is still a small chance to turn it around. Ultimately, what makes or breaks an FPS is its arsenal, and for the most part both games pass the test with flying rockets. So let's take a look at our Toys of Destruction. Your melee weapon is the Shield Gun, an evolution of 99's Impact Hammer. Its defining trait is a shield that nullifies projectiles for as long as it has ammo, which recharges when not in use. The second starting weapon is now the Assault Rifle, good for humiliating people and not much else. It quickly fires bullets that tickle enemies and launches grenades that deal good damage but lack ammo and are difficult to hit with. 2004 refreshed its appearance, gave it its own ammo type instead of sharing it with the minigun and it can now be dual wielded. The Bio-Rifle continues to filter newbies and destroying unsuspecting victims. 2004 slightly nerfed its damage, but a fully charged out fire remains a portable nuke, evaporating anyone without a ton of health and armor. The Shock Rifle also didn't get any changes to functionality, but it did get a much smoother design, which was then changed a second time in 2004. It retains the pinpoint accurate laser beam, the slow moving balls and the powerful shock combo triggered by combining the two. The pulse gun evolved into the link gun, which inherits its basic functionality. What makes it unique is that you can link it to another player's link gun to greatly amplify their damage. An interesting gimmick, but a gimmick nonetheless. Thankfully, 2004 saw fit to give it additional utility in exchange for reducing the outfire's damage. It now doubles as a repair tool that can restore vehicles and static defenses like turrets, and most importantly the power nodes in Onslaught, letting you more quickly capture each zone. The minigun's firing modes switched places, with the primary fire now being full speed, while the outfire is slower but more accurate and deals more damage with each shot. 2004 gave it a little boost in overall damage, which I think was the right choice because the minigun's time to kill in 2003 felt a bit too high. The flak cannon is still the golden boy, with its bouncy shrapnel and close range destruction. It's much less effective at a distance, but the new movement abilities make it easier to close the gap. The rocket launcher lost some damage and utility, since it can't launch grenades anymore and can only load up three rockets at once. But it remains a very dangerous weapon, and the enhanced mobility lets you take full advantage of the splash damage. The last of 2003's main arsenal is the Lightning Gun, a counterbalance to 99's sniper rifle. It still does tons of damage, and headshots are usually a one-hit kill, but it has a low firing rate and exposes the user's position, so hit and runs are much harder to pull off. The Redeemer also returns as one of two super weapons. It's a portable nuke that you can directly control in first person and creates a massive explosion that deletes anyone in its vicinity. But this time it's joined by the Ion Painter, which summons an Ion Blast at the target position. 2004 then brought its own additions, with one returning weapon and a trio of completely new ones. First off, the sniper rifle returns as an alternative to the lightning gun, dealing less damage but firing slightly faster and without a lightning trail to expose yourself. The mine layer is a newcomer that deploys spider mines that explode on contact with players and vehicles. They automatically run towards the nearest target, but with its outfire you can guide them manually. The grenade launcher shoots grenades that stick to players and can then be triggered to explode. 
while you can use it directly on enemies, the grenades can also be used to set up traps near important locations. Finally, the anti-vehicle rocket launcher, or Avril, is exactly what it says. It locks onto vehicles instantly and launches a slow but powerful rocket that deals high damage to them. You can try it against players on foot, but it doesn't cause more damage than regular rockets and is very easy to dodge. At a glance, the changes made to the old weapons don't seem dramatic. However, the balance has indirectly changed quite a bit, due to a variety of factors. The new weapon models have a more polished and cleaner look to them, which makes sense in universe. The tournament originated from riots in the Viandry mines, and the weapons were built as makeshift tools instead of crowd pleasers. And of course, they also take advantage of the new technology in Unreal Engine 2. It's the same with the environments and the player models. Remade maps like Face Classic take advantage of new hardware capabilities, while the reimagined variations such as Face 3 look more aesthetically pleasing. The latter in particular exemplifies the Egyptian influences taken by some of the artists, with its beautiful skyboxes and complex architecture that gives it a distinct look. The technical side no longer holds up, but the artistic side still shines. Player models now have significant differences between each other, and the proportions are different. They have bigger shoulders and smaller heads, which makes headshots more difficult to pull off consistently, and the extra movement options means that tripping up your enemy same is easier than ever. Yes, you can still dominate people with one-hit kills, but only if you have sweaty pro gamer hands. Bringing back the sniper rifle seems a bit counterintuitive, but to be fair, it has a slower firing rate than it had back in 99. It deals less damage and it slightly covers your view when it fires. On the subject of maps and models, I'd like to tell you about one of the reasons why the series once had such a strong audience. The modding community. Sometimes games come with modding tools, whether it be external programs like Unreal Ed or built-in stuff like the map editors on strategy games. Epic and Digital Extremes used to be very big proponents of giving fans the tools to make their own stuff and letting them go to town with it. The two studios would frequently highlight community creations in the community menu, and they also organized various bonus packs where the best stuff was packed into a big chunky package. It was beautiful to see the developers and the community coming together like this. Modders could also pack their stuff into the U-Mod format, which facilitated the installation process, while the mutator system lets you easily toggle each individual mod on and off, allowing players to pick exactly what they want to play with. I spent so many hours just browsing sites like Planet Unreal, exploring the downloads section to find new maps and mutators to try out. Every week there was something new to see, which kept the games fresh with a constant stream of content, both officially and unofficially supported. Maps, weapons, gameplay tweaks, new game modes, even total conversions that were practically an entirely new game at that point. Sure, not everything was good, but that just made the really good stuff even more amazing. Seeing people spend days, weeks, months, sometimes even years of their lives creating something they love is just plain wholesome. Some even allowed the mothers to pursue a dream career in the industry, which isn't as rare as you might think. You know Killing Floor? That started as a mod, while Runestorm, creators of ballistic weapons, went on to make Viscera clean up detail. The only screw-up with the modding support is that 2003 mods are not compatible with 2004, despite the two games looking nearly identical. 
I'm sure that there's a technical reason for this, and a lot of modders eventually moved to 2004 anyway. But it still sucks for people who loved specific maps or mutators that didn't get updated, or people who couldn't play 2004 due to not having the money or their PC not being up to par. Sadly, official modding support has become a rarity in the AAA space. The reason that immediately jumps out is that publishers would rather sell content as paid DLC. Which I think is a dumb approach, because having more content for your game just makes it more appealing. Ain't that right, Todd? But there's another reason, and that is the entry barrier. Graphics have evolved tremendously, and making a map that looks good in the year 2004 requires much less manpower than making a map that looks good in 2022. It's no coincidence that big games nowadays are made by very large teams, and it's also no coincidence that Classic Doom still has a ridiculously active modding community. Of course, modding is great, but you also need someone to play those mods with. That's another area where these games went above and beyond with their bot support. In some ways, they're even better than real players, since they constantly give you feedback and will listen to what you say to them. You can also choose their skill level, letting the game scale to players of all skill levels. And best of all, the game lets you choose exactly how many bots you want in each team, allowing the player to set up all kinds of silly scenarios. One of the benefits of having bots is that you don't need an internet connection to play. Living in a backwater island meant, and still means, that we are behind the curve on a lot of commodities that people living in a big metropolis take for granted. I have never had the chance to go to a LAN party, so for me, multiplayer with other people was only possible online. However, my family only got half-decent broadband internet around 2004, so in practice that's when I could finally properly play the games online. But there's another, much more important benefit, which is how it gives me something that a lot of modern games never do. The freedom to choose how, when and who I play with. Something that fell by the wayside with the advent of matchmaking and playlists. If I'm playing a game like this, I want to play it by my rules, not by the whims of developers and strangers with different ideas of fun. They want different game modes, they want different maps, different settings, different amounts of players, and so on. That's not how I grew up playing, and that's not how I want to play. If I want to go solo against a team of bots, that's my prerogative. If I want to use a bunch of horribly unbalanced mods, then let me do it. If I want to play on the same map for an entire hour, then by the love of all that is unholy, let me fucking do it. The standard now is for games to have different playlists for different game modes, but without any options to customize anything. Just a preset score and time limit, and a set of maps that you constantly cycle through, regardless of how much you like each one. And when the population dies down, everyone flocks to the most popular ones while the rest ends up dead. Sometimes you can customize these options in a custom private match. After all, the options are there. But then you most likely also do not have any meaningful bot support, and that's entirely ass backwards. Despite all of its good qualities, Unreal Tournament 2004 had lost steam by the next year, thanks to a very packed set of releases. So without bots, the game would effectively be unplayable. So when those stupid games die out and nobody can find a match anymore, I'll still be here, enjoying the finest multiplayer shooter ever made, all by myself, with my digital slaves. Anyway, let's go back to weapons for a bit and discuss balance. While the games have an overall great arsenal, I do feel that the new starting weapon really puts the ass in Assault Rifle. Like the Enforcer Pistols in 99, the Assault Rifle is meant to be a backup weapon, not a main part of your loadout. 
but while the Enforcer could reliably kill players due to its ok damage, firing rate and accuracy, the Assault Rifle can't. It's fast, but deals pistol damage, and accuracy is a joke. The grenades at least deal a good chunk of damage, but they are very hard to hit with, and you start with only 4 grenades. It was buffed in 2004, but in practice nothing changed, since it's rare to find a second one so you can dual wield them, and it doesn't have a niche for itself when the minigun is straight up superior in every way. Some of the complaints I had about weapon balance back in the first game still apply, but not to the same degree due to the changes in visuals and movement. The developers took the big brain approach of expanding the ways in which you can avoid getting hit instead of just nerfing the weapons themselves, incentivizing skilled play instead of brainless beam spam. The shock rifle remains one of the top dogs, with the same versatility, accuracy and damage it previously had. It's arguably still over central icing, but a fast player is capable of dodging the beams more easily. It's the same with the lightning gun and the sniper rifle. They are still deadly, but require more precision and consistently good aim to reach the same level of abuse that occurred in 99. But on the other hand, there are two opposite views on how the adrenaline system works, and how it can widen the gap between the new players and the pros. A common dilemma in multiplayer game design is keeping a balance between rewarding skilled players while making sure that lesser ones can still contribute to their team. I mean, if you play better, you deserve being rewarded for it, right? The better you do, the more adrenaline you get, and the more often you can trigger combos. But it also ends up giving the skilled players an even bigger advantage, while the newbies get their asses kicked even harder. Some games try to balance this by giving the losing team a bonus so that they can fight back in some way. For example, Counter-Strike gives the losers some bonus cash, letting them buy more expensive weapons. In other words, compensate for the skill gap by giving the losing team better tools. Is this the ideal way to do it? I'm sad to say that I don't have an answer for this. What I will say is that it's much like the mechanical changes between the two games. It won't matter for the majority of people, and the games weren't intended to be perfectly balanced esports material, like how every multiplayer game seems to be nowadays. But enough about skill gaps and weapons. Let's crack the hammer down on Double Domination, a mode with a number of questionable design decisions. The issue lies with the layout of the maps and the capture mechanics. In several maps, the control points are located in places that are very easy to reach, and because taking control is just a matter of touching the icon, it can quickly devolve into a stalemate, as both teams constantly recapture the zones without scoring a single point. But ironically, certain maps have the exact opposite problem of being so big that there isn't even a chance to interrupt the countdown, because the other team simply can't reach the area in time. All it takes is for one team to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, and the other team just scored a free point. Sun Temple is the worst offender, featuring a massive corridor with no cover and two smaller but still dangerous paths. And since player positions don't get reset between rounds, players can just camp the zones for a quick capture. A possible solution to these problems would be to require players to stay still for a couple of seconds to capture control points, while also pausing any current countdown. This would give the defenders a bit of time to blast the attackers away, before having their domination interrupted. So, you've watched this far, and you want to play the games yourself. Well, first of all, go straight to 2004, but if you really want to play 2003, you will have to grab a retail copy, since it's not available digitally. Once you've got it installed, grab the updates and the bonus packs from the PC Gaming Wiki page, and it should be playable on Windows 10. 
However, the game officially only supports 4x3 resolutions, so you should open the config file and change it to match your screen's aspect ratio. Both games natively run on DirectX 8, which for technical reasons isn't fully supported on Windows 10, so you might want to use something like Crosshire's DX8 to DX9 wrapper. This will let you force vSync through your GPU driver's settings if you want. You might also want to add some anti-aliasing and an isotropic filtering. If those don't take effect in-game, open the executable's properties and check the option that says Disable Full Screen Optimizations. For Unreal Tournament 2004, you will have to install the updates manually if you have a retail copy, while the digital release, the Editor's Choice Edition, comes with the latest update. For the bonus packs, again check the PC Gaming Wiki page for downloads. Besides that, the same tweaks apply here. The game's last update came with an experimental 64-bit executable that can run natively on DirectX 9, but this seems to cause stuttering issues and breaks certain effects, so I recommend using the regular executable with the DX8 to DX9 wrapper instead. Well, that's it. Thanks for listening to me ramble about one of my favorite games of all time. Finally making a video about it means that I've reached one of the goals I had when I started, five years ago. I've been playing this game for almost two decades now, and I still love it just as much as I did in 2004. It's a hell of a blast even today, and one of the games that have earned a permanent spot on my hard drive. The only regret I have is that my retail copy is the one that comes in CDs. Six of them. But as we all know, the future of the series wasn't very rosy. 2004 hit the peak, and it was all downhill from there. Unreal Tournament 3 is a decent game today, but it kicked off with a rough start and never fully recovered, while the reboot is doomed to the ages. Oh, there was also that attempt at a sequel to the original Unreal, but we're all better off forgetting that piece of shit. Hardcore fans will continuously argue whether 99 or 2004 is the best one, but for me at least, 2004 is the pinnacle of how to make a fun, engaging FPS and how to foster a strong bond between the development team and the community, something that was lost with Unreal Tournament 3's misguided attempts at returning to its roots. And of course, the Unreal name is now more synonymous with the engine itself than any of the games, with digital extremes focusing on Warframe and Epic focusing on Fortnite and engine development. Businesses that are far more profitable than the Unreal games ever were.